Thank you, sir. All right, very good. Amen. <laughs> well, if you didn't get that official notification, I don't know what. <laughs> Welcome to Family Sunday School. We've got a, a special message this morning. If you would, in your Bibles, turn to Psalm chapter 12. Psalm chapter 12, as we all get uh, seated and ready here. Psalm chapter 12. In verse number 6, once you get there, the words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Now God uses pure language. Verse 7, Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Now I want you to notice what he's teaching here. That God's words are forever. If you notice the sign when you came in this morning, what does it say? It says the gift of God is eternal security. Now the verse in the Bible from Romans 6 comes is eternal life, but I put eternal security because that's what it's talking about. Once you're saved, you're always saved. But notice what this verse says. Verse 7, Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. I want to talk about the eternal Scriptures and the eternal preservation of God's Word. Look at the next verse, verse 8. The wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. What he's saying is when vile, disgusting, inappropriate people are put forth and God's Word is put down, then the vile are exalted. Then we have a problem. When God's Word is missing, then vile, evil, wicked people begin to prosper. There is a generation, they hate the words of God, and I believe they are controlling, uh, manipulating the entertainment, the politics, the finances, the government of the entire world. This should not come as much of a surprise. Uh, very few governments, could you say, are good government or righteous government. And yet we need government to a certain extent. The government is there uh, to defend the innocent. But when the government is out of bounds, there's a problem. I want to talk this morning about the preservation of God's Word and His eternal Scriptures. Uh, let's open up in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask that at this time you would help us to focus and learn. Lord, I do ask that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit. Lord, those that are here that are saved, I ask that you also would fill them with, their Holy, with your Holy Spirit, that they might learn something and retain something that will strengthen their confidence in your Word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to tell you the history of how we have the King James Bible to a certain extent. And I know we covered this in depth over the past month, last month. We're not going to rehash any of that. This is sort of new information. Uh, this is not typically called the King James Bible until we got to about the 1900s. Prior to that, it was known as the Authorized Version. It was most famously just known as the Holy Bible. Now, prior to that, you had a few other Bibles in circulation. And what happened was, well, uh, in 1601, the then Scottish King James publicly proclaimed that we needed a trustworthy version of the Bible, that it was essential. Two years later, in 1603, he also became the King of England, and so he was now the King of Scotland and the King of England at that time. In less than a year's time, he announced in 1604 that he was chartering a new English translation. You have to understand that the English language as we know it had been developing. The Anglos and the Saxons became the Anglish. We call it English. And they were forging a new language. And some of the other Bibles had not really perfected the language. I tell you, the English language as we speak it today, we have to thank the authorized version, what we call 
the King James Bible. This is important. We say a lot of things that came directly from here. Words we use came directly out of here. Spellings were developed through here. Now, as he had commissioned in 1604 the authorized version, he had approved 54 translators specifically in six different companies that they would begin to solidify God's Word. Very soon after that, the next year in 1605, November the 5th, today, 1605, there was a man named Guy Fawkes. His real name was Guido. And Guy Fawkes conspired to destroy the translation of the King James Bible and to assassinate the king and his family. Guy Fawkes on November the 5th was caught under Parliament with 36 barrels of TNT, of dynamite. He was literally caught in the act about to light it and blow them up. He wanted to stop the King James Bible translation. There is a nursery rhyme that they use in England, and it goes like this. Remember, remember the 5th of November, gunpowder, treason, and plot. I see no reason why gunpowder treason should ever be forgot. Guy Fawkes, Guy Fawkes, t'was his intent to blow up the king and parliament. Three score barrels of powder below, poor old England to overthrow. By God's providence was he catched with a dark lantern and burning match. Holler, boys! Holler, boys! Let the bells ring! Holler, boys! Holler, boys! God save the king! Now, in England, they have quite a history of this. They actually make a Guy Fawkes mask, and they parade in the street. Now, I, I can't wear this thing for too long. I think it's kind of weird. It looks like a devil to me, but um, they parade in this Guy Fawkes mask, and they do this every year. Anybody want to come wear this thing for me for the next hour? I'm just kidding. We won't do that. <laughs> Since my wife's not here this morning, we'll put it in the flowers. I'll tell you, you're not going to believe what happened. Okay. So Guy Fawkes, they go through this effigy. They bring out an effigy, which is like a straw man, literally. Okay, And they bring him out in the street and they parade him because as the story goes, once they caught him, uh, they begin to interrogate him, which if you know what that means in the 1600s, yeah, they tortured him. And he finally gave up all the conspirators. There were many men involved. They were funded by the Jesuits. Now, if you know anything about the history of the Jesuits, the Jesuits was a very perverse secret society within the Catholic Church. They originated as secret assassins. A Jesuit learned techniques of manipulation, deception, and mind control. They were known for tattooing an image of Christ on their breast so that when they spake of Christ, they could lie and really speak of themselves. They, in a certain regard, considered themselves as a god, as a higher being, and they were there doing a greater work, and it was okay to manipulate and to deceive. They worked for the Catholic Church to overthrow governments, debase currencies. They're closely related to the history of the Templars, if you know who I'm talking about, which they were full of sodomy and abuse and all sorts of strange history. The Jesuits today are known for the, pub the publishing house of the Catholic Church. They started as assassins, and now they're known for propaganda. They print the literature to deceive the simple. This Je Jesuit-funded assassination plan was ousted, and they figured out who was involved. Uh, it was only stopped because of a... Uh, an anonymous note that was given that there would be a, uh, a big blast in Parliament, so to speak, that it would uh, take out much of the king and his house, that sort of thing. So they started looking. They ended up finding him. They saw who he was connected to, who had funded him. He gave up the people. He actually told, gave names. Many of these people were killed. He was one of the last. He was hanged. He was drawn and quartered. 
If you don't know what that means, ask the Pelsings and the Stricklands. They were just cutting up chickens yesterday, okay? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not very fun. He was used as a public example of this is what happens when you try to stop the king. Now, I am not going to pretend like King James was a perfect person because we know there are no perfect people. However, God, I do believe, divinely used him to finish the English language to really polish it off. And he did it by giving us his word in the language of the world even to this day. Uh, I was talking to a lady yesterday. I was out changing the sign, and she lives down the street, and she said... Uh, I've been seeing you guys, and I love the sign, and it, it looks like you guys are got some life going on in there, and I'm excited. I want to come visit on Wednesdays. And uh, we talked about several things, and she asked about the Bible translation issue. And she said, I saw on your sign last week that it says, does your Bible have Acts 837? Now, believe it or not, that was not my choice for the sign. That was all you, Brother Chad, right? I think so, I think so he says. He says, I'll take the blame on that one. So she says, I remember that, but I haven't had a chance to look it up yet. Tell me about that. And so I explained why it was deleted, because the Catholics want to baptize babies so that they can enter into the covenant of salvation. That's what the Calvinists do also. And so it's intentionally omitted, it's deleted from the majority of the Bible translations out there. Uh, just a fascinating bit of history. So the royal guards, they searched, they found him, they tortured him. And uh, he had 36 barrels of TNT. He probably would have destroyed himself in the poorly organized uh, uh, assassination attempt as it's reported. Now, this is important with the King James Bible, the Word of God, as we have it today. Back then, they had very few choices. They commonly had what was called the Great Bible. And it was great. It was like a, a two-hander. Like, I mean, it took some work. Now, it did not have any chapter delineation. It was a very difficult to read font. And so finding a verse was not an easy task. If you said, go to Isaiah 51.1, they'd probably say, ooh, uh, hold on. This is going to take a little time. There is no 51. There is no 1. I have to sort through Isaiah and look for something in particular. They also had what was called the Bishop's Bible, and it really was catered to what was called the bishops back then. The word bishop in the Bible means pastor, but back then when you had the political control for churches, since church had been hijacked by the pagan Catholics, their bishops, they would call them, uh, did not meet the biblical standard for a bishop, husband of one wife, namely, you have to be married to be a pastor. Oh no, they said we're married to the church, right? They would twist scripture, manipulate scripture. That one was chartered by Queen the Elizabeth, and it was very difficult to read. It used a very pretentious and pious and high-minded language. Toward, it did not really flow. It's not something you could, that would just roll off the tongue, per se. You also had the Geneva Bible. It was then, at, at the, this time, a, a bit of an underground Bible. It was not authorized by like King Henry or Queen Elizabeth. This one was different, but the Geneva Bible had a lot of problems also. The Geneva Bible is also known as the John Calvin Study Bible. It literally had John Calvin's study notes, Matthew 3, for instance, in the footnotes, on the side notes, you could call it. It would say uh, that you have to be sorry for your sins and change your way to be able to be saved. Now, that is lordship salvation. That is what Calvinism teaches, that you have to do good works to be saved. The Bible does not teach repent of your sins to be saved. It does not teach you have to be sorry for your sins to be saved. The Bible teaches us that the gospel is the good news. When's the last time you started weeping with sorrow when somebody told you good news? Well, it doesn't make sense. Calvinism is a manipulation. John Calvin was a French lawyer who was Catholic the majority of his life. He converted to Protestantism. He became um, a, a little governor, if you will, of Geneva. And he was part of the Geneva Bible to a certain extent. There's like a 12-page introduction from him in the Bible. There have been several revisions of the Geneva Bible. But the Calvinism view of repentance is not change your mind, what the word literally means. The Calvinism view is you must be sorry 
Well, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible uses the word repent as change your mind, not be sorry. This is an important distinction. Well, the King James, by, King James actually, um, in referring to the Geneva Bible, he's quoted as saying, it is partial, untrue, and seditious. Now, sedition is a form of rebellion, and part of the problem with the Geneva Bible, uh, John Calvin and his followers influenced the language where they took the name king, where it literally means king, and they changed it to the word tyrant. And so King James was like, a king isn't always a tyrant. Now, there are times kings can be tyrants, but that's just poor interpretation or translation to take the word king and turn it into tyrant. So there's a little bit of a conspiracy with a lot of the language in the Geneva Bible. The Lordship's salvation is the biggest heresy. The footnotes dealing with predestination, and which is basically if you're really saved, then you are destined to turn from all your sin and live a perfect life. So Calvinism is damnable heresy. Uh, we are not part of Catholic church history. No, sir. We are completely separate and distinct from Catholic church history and doctrine. That's important. If you would go to Proverbs chapter 30 with me, I want to give you a few verses this morning and show you some great things about how the scriptures are eternally preserved by God. God has made a promise that His word will never go away. He has held that true forever. There are many false Bibles that have risen up and fallen away. There are many false prophets also that come and go. Now, today in America, unfortunately, one of the most popular selling Bibles on a yearly basis is the NIV. However, if you take a stand back and say, what is the most sold Bible ever, it's still the King James. What is the most read ever? It's the King James. Uh, those that say, well, I come from that great generation 20, 30, 40 years ago. We were raised in a different society. Yeah, that's because people were raised on this. They were raised in church with the fear of the Lord, with a desire to know His Word. Christianity was different back then. I want to talk about an unforgivable sin. Sort of. Most people will say, I, I want to know about the unforgivable sin. I always say, well, there isn't one unforgivable sin, but I would say there's three. I say, well, now, wait a minute. That's a contradiction. Did Jesus die for all sins? Okay. But it refers to an unforgivable sin. We see it in Matthew and Mark, and I think it's Mark, was it chapter 3, where he talks about that a man that says that Jesus had a devil, it said this man hath no forgiveness. It's not just that that one sin of saying Jesus had a devil was unforgivable. It's showing that's the heart of a man that has no forgiveness for any sin. Uh, the Bible uses certain terms like a reprobate, a child of the devil, a reject, uh, dross, which is the, the junk that's on top of the silver when you purify the silver. So with that, there are Certain people that do things that just don't come naturally is what Romans 1 would tell us. Well, there's a couple sins that I would call an unforgivable sin, but really Jesus paid for them all. One is to say Jesus had a devil. Two would be to take the mark of the beast. And three is what I'm about to show you, which is to manipulate the Word of God and change it to deceive people. Now, if you are quoting the Bible and you misquote it, that's not you changing the Bible if you write it down and you misspell it, that's not you trying to manipulate, manipulate people. I'm talking about people that say, what can we do so that we can take out that verse that you have to be saved before you're baptized? How can we get that out of there? What can we do to change that it's just by faith alone and try to say that people have to be sorry for their sins and turn from their sins and live a good life and turn over a new leaf and change their life or they might not make it to heaven? So that's really what the, the agenda behind that is, is manipulating God's Word. You're in Proverbs 30. I want you to see this promise in verse number 4. Who hath ascended up into heaven, or descended? Who hath gathered the wind in his fists? Who hath bound the waters in a garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is his son's name, if thou canst tell? Uh, what's his son's name? Jesus. And he's also called the Word of God. Look at this, verse 5. Every word of God is pure, 
He is a shield unto them that put their trust in Him. God's Word is a shield. It will defend you against the darts of the, uh, the fiery darts of the enemy, right? The, the, the uh, fiery arrows from Satan himself. Look at verse 6. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. So he says, don't add to God's words or he'll correct you. Now go to Deuteronomy 4. Go to Deuteronomy chapter number 4. I want to share this concept with you that all throughout the Bible this warning exists. That if you're tampering with God's Word, you're going to cross a line with God. And when you cross a line with God in your heart, you become a man or a woman, a person that doesn't have any forgiveness because you've rejected God and His Word and His gift. This is important. Deuteronomy chapter 4, look at verse number 2. Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it. He says, don't add to God's word and don't take away from it. That ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. Your eyes have seen what the Lord did because of Baal Peor. For all the men that followed Baal Peor, the Lord thy God hath destroyed them from among you. Now go to Revelation 22. Last chapter in the Bible. Revelation chapter 22. When you get there, find verse number 17. So we see it in Moses at the beginning of the Bible. We see it in the books of wisdom right there in Proverbs. I want you to see it at the end. It sort of bookends. This concept flows all the way through. Revelation 22 verse 17. And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Did you notice that this verse teaches salvation is free to anybody? Amen. Isn't that a beautiful verse? It's not only to those that have cleaned up their life. It's not only to those that go to church. It's not only to those that read their Bible, it's to whosoever will may come. And this is so important because we in the flesh, we struggle with our sin, and God says it's free of charge. Verse 18, look at this, Revelation 22, 18, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. Now I want you to think about it. If somebody, as with the Pharisees Jesus was dealing with, and they made it hard for them to enter into the kingdom of heaven, they put a burden on them that was impossible. Can you imagine if somebody knocks on that door and says, Pastor, I want to get saved, but I've got this heroin problem and I just can't kick it. And really, frankly, I enjoy it so much, I'm not sure I want to kick it. And I said, well, listen, buddy, if you're not sorry for your sin... And if you don't quit your sin, you can't go to heaven. Woe unto me for making it hard for somebody to enter into heaven. Rather, I should say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And then the Holy Spirit will come and live inside of you and dwell in you. And He can help you kick the heroin. Don't put the cart before the horse. That's exactly what John Calvin did. So if you add to salvation, God says, I'm going to add to the plagues. If you add to God's Word, as many false Bibles have, God's going to add the plagues to you. Look at verse 19. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall, add, shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. So those that delete the verses intentionally, Helen Mollencott, we talked about her last month, God said, you know what? I died for your sins and salvation was free. All you had to do was choose me and I'm going to delete the place where your name could have been while you're still alive because you hate me and you reject me and you're working against me. I'll turn you over to a reprobate mind and sear your conscience. This is important. Go to, go to Psalm 119. Psalm 119 if you would. Middle of the Bible. We're talking about the eternal scriptures. We know about eternal security. We're talking about the eternal scriptures. And, you know, I'm sorry, I'll take this goofy thing out of there. You guys don't have to keep looking at that. Guy Fawkes was a false prophet that hated the Bible. He worked for the Jesuits. He conspired to kill the king and stop the Bible. 
And, you know, God saved the King James Bible. And he did. And he preserved it. And we have it. We should embrace it and love it. Well, you're going to Psalm 119. Let me read 2 Timothy 3.16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. That means God breathed it. It came from Him. He's given us the, the Scriptures. It says, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. You're in Psalm 119. Go near the end. Verse 160. Verse 160. Thy word is true from the beginning. In every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. Thy word is true. What's he say? It's righteous. And he says it endureth forever. I want you guys to understand this thing's going to outlive y'all. It's going to outlive me, won't it? Lastly, let's go to Isaiah 55 together and we'll finish there. Isaiah 55. While you're going there, let me read 2 Peter 1. It says, we also have a more sure word of prophecy. What we have today is more sure than the visions that Peter saw. We have it written down, and we have the Holy Spirit to confirm it and teach us. He says, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. God's Spirit came in them by faith, and then God's Spirit spoke out of them to give us holy scriptures that we can trust in. In Isaiah 55, once you're there, go to verse number 11. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth, it shall not return unto me void. But it shall accomplish that thing which I pleased, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I send it. God's word will not return void. It's valuable, it's powerful, it's eternal, and he has a purpose. Now the thing is, he needs you. You say, what does God need me for? Well, I'll tell you what He needs you for. Uh, to plant the seeds of the Word of God. To get it in your heart, to get it in your mind, and be ready, a willing vessel that God can use to teach the Word of God to others. When somebody has a question, we're called to answer that question and dissolve their doubts and to give a reason to everyone that asketh, aren't we? So what do we do? Well, we fill this up in here and we let it come out of there. And then don't worry about the rest. God will take care of the rest. Once that seed is planted in their heart, your job is done, then the Holy Spirit takes over. In fact, he uses that illustration in Mark 4. He says that he gave the illustration of the sower sowing seeds, a guy planting seeds, and he's just throwing seeds on all sorts of ground. And I mean, we're talking about planting some stuff over here. And I'm like, I want to, you know, we're going to maybe do this here and we'll do that there. We want to come up with a plan, right? Jesus says, you take this word and you just throw it everywhere you go. Yeah, but not at work. No, we throw it at work. Not in the ditch. We throw it in the ditch and we throw it at church and we throw it everywhere we go. His word is called a seed. We want to plant these seeds in the heart of men that it might find some good soil and grow up. There's other types of soil, which is the hearts of men, where it chokes out the word and they're not fruitful. They never have any Christian fruit in their life. Or it lands on a stone. And it never grows at all. We still throw it on the stones. When I knock on the door and I go to preach the gospel to somebody, if I recognize right away, whoa, this person looks like they hate God and the things they're saying is they hate God, I'm still going to try my best to preach to them. That's my job. And I have to tell you, God's Word is forever. Whether you're a king or a tyrant or an assassin or a pope, or a priest, if you try to stop the Word of God, then you're going to have God working against you. He warns us that in the last days, it'll be hard to find His Word. Amos 8.11, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land. Not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of the hearing of the words of the Lord. Now you think about it. Somebody was giving descriptions yesterday at the funeral how to find the church. And they said, you turn here, you turn there. And it's the, it's the, ch the church on the right. They said, it's the right church. I, well, amen, it's, it's the right church. You got that right. Okay, right. Now, now, but think about it. How many churches are there nearby here? Well, there's a Mormon church over here, and there's a liquor store over here, and there's a pulp mill over there, and we've got all sorts of businesses around. How many churches are really out there shining the light of the Word of God? There's a church down the road here, and let me tell you what they have. Boy, they have rock and roll and candy for the kids. 
They'll give your kids a 15 minute lesson and let them go sit on bean bags and play a PlayStation and they call it church? No. We need the Word of God. And you know, the famine has come not because there's many assassins, because we're too busy distracting ourselves with the cares of this world. I always heard it growing up by these old time preachers. They say, You watch in the end times, they're going to make the Bible illegal. And I think they will. They already have in parts of Canada and certain states. What is it? Oklahoma. There's certain states in America now where it's like, you're not allowed to say that marriage is a man and a woman. They're going to make parts of it illegal, but why would they even have to make it illegal when they make this so popular? This is their God. This is their idol. This is their entertainment. This is where they get their opinion, their philosophy, their doctrine. But God's Word is forever. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank You so much for preserving Your Word. Lord, I do ask that You would help us to fall in love with it all over again and just embrace it. Lord, help us to go to You and look for help. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you are